right, good afternoon, everyone. I know we still have a few folks joining us, but I'll go ahead and get us started. My name is Deanna Fenton, Senior Manager of Program Development and Operations here at the Alliance. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation series program, where we'll share highlights and insights from the OPTN DCD Procurement Collaborative Improvement Project. Now, as always, we encourage you to use this as an opportunity to engage with our panel and ask questions. That said, please take this opportunity to locate the chat feature which is located at the very bottom of your Zoom window. Please feel free to submit any questions or even comments you may have at any time. Additionally, if you happen to be joining us as a group, we'd like to ask that you take a moment to complete the following poll to indicate approximately how many people have joined your group. That's all I'm going to see, there we go. Now to get us started, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Amanda Habermill, who serves as a manager of hospital development at Connect Life and is also a valued member of the Alliance's Conversation Series work group. Amanda, thank you so much for being with us today. I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Deanna, and thank you all for joining us today. Today's discussion will provide an overview of the OPTN DCD Procurement Collaborative Improvement Project, and would include two, how two OPOs implemented their changes with this initiative. I have the pleasure of introducing our three energetic panelists today. So without further delay, please allow me to introduce them. Kate Wrightbill has been with UNOS for almost 11 years and is a performance improvement specialist on the collaborative improvement team. Prior to joining UNOS, Kate worked in the public health sector, focusing on epidemiology and infectious diseases. Our second speaker today is going to be Dr. Javier Nieto. He is a medical graduate from Mexico, who started working with LifeGift in 2015. He has worked as a bedside organ coordinator and later moved on to the manager position overseeing the daily operation and donation clinical specialist group Javi has recently transitioned to his current position as an abdominal recovery surgeon. During his free time, Javi enjoys playing with his three kids and going out with his wife on dates after entertaining them while playing the violin. He is currently training for his next 26.2 miles running marathon. Our last speaker is Jackie Roos. She has been with Life Shares, Life Sharing since 2019 as an organ procurement coordinator. She has recently taken on the EEOC role and enjoys precepting new coordinators. She has an extensive nursing background with more than 10 years of ICU experience, including a tour in Afghanistan with the Navy. She is a certified Lean Six Sigma black belt and has utilized these skills toward many performance improvement initiatives within the organization. I look forward to the discussion. So Kate, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Let me share my screen and we will get started. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. So thank you everybody. Thanks Amanda and thanks to the Alliance for this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here and to share uh, kind of an overview of the OPTN DCD Procurement Collaborative, which just recently wrapped this summer. So what I'm gonna do today is kind of do a brief introduction of OPTN Collaboratives in general, review the framework of the DCD Collaborative and then turn it over to Javi and Jackie who are gonna talk about their individual improvement projects. So first and foremost, just to level set, I know there's some of you who may not be familiar with these initiatives, but collaborative improvement initiatives, first and foremost, align with OPTN's strategic goals. And they are initiatives where there's an identified gap in practice. So where is someone doing something well that someone can learn from to implement those practices in their own organization to support growth and improvement? These initiatives also are recognized by the community as a, as a desired place for improvement and they must have the ability to impact change and, and actually provide a benefit to the community. Collaborative improvement projects are not research related. They don't drive policy and they're not related to compliance, but what they are are elective quality improvement projects. When we deploy collaborative improvement projects through the OPTN, we, we base them loosely off the IHI breakthrough series collaborative model, which some of you are pretty familiar with. You start with a topic of where you wanna improve you engage with practice model organizations or PMOs. So those are the identified organizations that are doing something really well. And we learn from them and find what their key drivers to success are. And we develop an improvement guide, which is kind of the framework for improvement. Once we figure out what those key drivers are, we kind of plan what the project's gonna look like, how many participants are we gonna enroll, um, what's the length of engagement gonna look like, and then we get started. During the pre-work phase of a collaborative, um, Participants get familiar with the project, they develop their project charters, they form their teams, they kind of get oriented to the, to the project in general, 
And then we start the engagement period, which is where the real fun and the real collaboration occurs. So during the engagement period or the improvement cycles, individual organizations can work on their improvements through their project charters. They have individualized coaching provided by us at the OPTN. Um, we provide collaborative calls, webinars, we have report outs and, and things like that to keep the collaborative um, spirit kind of going. And then we kind of culminate everything at the end with um, sharing the learnings and seeing how we can spread what we've learned, which is why we're here today. So just a brief overview of the DCD Procurement Collaborative. There are actually two separate cohorts. So the goal of both cohorts was to increase DCD donor procurement overall. Cohort A, the engagement period ran from January to June of 2021. Uh, the goal was to increase donors by 20% over the year prior. And we had 26 OPOs who participated in the first cohort. During cohort B, the engagement period ran from November 21 through April of 22. And the goal was to increase DCD donors by 28%. And we had 30 OPOs participate in this cohort, including 13 from cohort A. So all in all, we had 43 OPOs, which is a little over 75% of all OPOs participated in one or both of the cohorts. Just a quick review of the timeline. We initiated this project back in July of 2019, where we visited our practice model organizations and put together our improvement package and figured out what those key drivers were. Um, towards the fall of 19 and the beginning of 2020, we did have to take a pause. One, because we heard that CMS was going to be coming out with a new initiative, and we didn't want to overlap with that initiative. And then COVID hit, so everything kind of came to a screeching halt, as we all know. So when we got to kind of the end of 2020, we realized that there was time and space and people had adjusted to COVID enough to start a cohort. So we actually ran our first, first cohort in January of 2021. And then we also realized that we could sneak in a second cohort before the CMS initiative was really deployed. So we, we pushed that cohort in from November 21 to April 22. And then we final, we, we bring this the collaborative to a wrap by a learning Congress, which we just had in July. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So just a quick snapshot of all the participants across the country. Uh, the light blue OPOs are, or the light blue is represented by OPOs from cohort A, the dark blue is cohort B, and the orange is both cohorts. So as I mentioned, I kept talking about mentioning the key drivers to success and what we found was there were three key drivers for increasing DCD donor procurement. It's really taking a look at the clinical practices and staffing structures, improving relationships both with donor hospitals and transplant programs, and then enhancing that process for obtaining or, um, authorizations. So throughout this project, we had those overall collaborative aims for each cohort had their individual aims. And then each organization that participated had their own separate organizational goal that they worked on to feed into that larger goal. So we know that every OPO came to the table kind of at a different starting point. Some OPOs had already worked on improvement projects, so their goal for growth may have been a little smaller. Some were just embarking on it for the first time, so they had some pretty strong stretch goals. But each one worked on their own individual project within one of these three main categories. When we deployed the collaborative, I wanted to kind of highlight just a few of the collaborative activities. So first and foremost, one of the benefits of participating in an OPTN collaborative is access to a private dashboard, which is um, a private SharePoint site, which has an opportunity for discussion boards, it has an opportunity to share resources. So you'll see here at the bottom left of this little chart, you can see participant resources. So participants are able to upload tools, checklists, um, protocols, policies, timeout, procedures, huddles, anything that they want to share with the rest of the participants. We also included any of the resources that we obtained from our practice model organizations as well. So this, this um, private SharePoint site is, ac has, is accessible only by participants who are sharing amongst the collaborative. We also have individual data dashboards. So you'll see here, this is just an example of one of the dashboards from the DCD Collaborative, where the orange bar is where that organization had set their goal for the project. The blue bar is the number of donors procured during the, the time frame previously, so what we're measuring against. And then the green bar is showing that organization's growth and, and progress towards their overall goal. Throughout the collaborative, we use Microsoft Teams a lot and had a lot of breakout rooms. So we use these breakout rooms to really to allow people to engage in small group conversations and discussions. Um, we had calls related to uh, rapid DCDs. We had calls about COVID, allocation practices, changing the language, 
um, all kinds of things monthly throughout the collaborative. We also hosted webinars where different OPOs could provide information on their individual improvement projects. And then, as I mentioned previously, we did provide one-on-one -on -one coaching with each OPO throughout the, pro the, pro the progress of the collaborative. So this next slide is a little bit busy and I did it with intent. I um, wanted to give you kind of an example or show you some examples of the different projects that OPOs worked on throughout the course of the collaborative. I went back through all 43 of the charters and took a look at what each OPO was working on and they all kind of fell into one of these different categories. So as you can see, there's tons of different things that people worked on in many different areas, but they all kind of fell into those same kind of three key buckets of change. So I wanted to share some highlights. There's been some articles that have already been posted on the OBTN website about the results of the DCD donor procurement book cohort A and B, but I wanted to share this slide just to show what the cohorts did throughout their, their cohort. Um, cohort A, the goal was to increase by 20%, and not only did they meet that goal, but they exceeded it and actually procured 34% more than they did the year prior. Cohort B had a bit of a loftier goal for a 28% increase over the six months prior from the, the year prior. And while we didn't meet the goal, they actually did have an increase of 21%. So we got very close. And again, there were some OPOs from cohort A who already made great strides during cohort A, so maybe their growth wasn't quite as big in cohort B. But we did have great growth in both cohorts. I do also want to mention that there was growth in the nation overall in DCD as well, but the growth in these cohorts was greater than the growth in the nation. So we think that's just a, a great tribute to participating in the collaborative. So I want to wrap with kind of um, highlighting the Learning Congress, which we just had in July in Denver, where we brought all OPOs together for a day and a half in-person meeting. This gave us the opportunity to highlight the individual OPO improvement projects that took place throughout the pro throughout both cohorts. Um, we capitalized on the collaborative spirit by having guided discussions on key topics such as what data you're using to drive improvement, how are you, what metrics are you looking at, authorization strategies, allocation practices, and then we had separate role-based breakout rooms where people could discuss common challenges among key roles. The Learning Congress was limited to two people from each OPO, so it was a smaller, smaller group, and that was really to encourage the collaboration and keep that conversation going. But I want to share a great resource for those of you who weren't able to be there in attendance. Through the OPTN Learning Management System, which is UNOS Connect and UNET, we have a DCD procurement collaborative playlist. So on this playlist, you'll see different recordings of the presentations from the Learning Congress. We were able to record the presentations where OPOs were presenting on their improvement work. So here you'll see um, the three presentations around optimizing the clinical practices and staffing, strengthening the relationships, enhancing authorizations. And then also we had a plenary session related to some pretty interesting DCD procurement case studies. So each one of these modules is available for your viewing and you know connect and you can be awarded SEPSI credit hours for these as well. And the last thing I want to mention about the Learning Congress is this little document down here on the bottom right of this uh, slide. So there's the Learning Congress summary. So while we were not able to record the breakout sessions and the conversations that took place, we did our best to really try to summarize the, the key take home points from those conversations at the Learning Congress. So if you want to read more and learn more about what those conversations looked like while they were in person, you can access the OPTN Learning Congress summary from the UNIS Connect playlist. And with that, if you want to know more information about collaborative improvement projects in general, you can find us on the OPTN website under collaborative improvement. And with that, I will turn it over to Javi and happy to take any questions um, at the end. All right, thank you very much, Kate. And thank you very much to the Alliance for allowing us to present today. And uh, I'm going to talk today a little bit about our project of the first person authorization in DCD and uh, how did we get went from request to honoring the gifts for uh, the, the patients that have already decided to be a DCD donor or have already decided to be a registered donor. My name is Javi Nieto and I am one of the abdominal organ recovery surgeons at LifeGift. 
I do not have any financial disclosure with the exception of that, as you can read on my title, it is from Mexico, meaning that I am a medical cirujano, which is a medical doctor from Mexico. That legally means that I can take your organs out when you're a deceased donor. I cannot prescribe you nothing for your headache. So I apologize for that. Legally, I cannot prescribe you or give you any medical advice other than taking your organs out. I do have three children, as it was mentioned on my bio. Thankfully, they're not going to interrupt today because they are all in a school. So they are here in presence. So I can have recordings if you want to start falling. If I see that you're falling asleep or something, I can just play a recording of them screaming so that we wake all up. So how did we get here? And when I say here, I mean to the day where we went to the first person authorization on the DCD donors. And uh, well, we started, as it was mentioned on cohort A, during cohort A, we did three, four different projects. The first one was a PDSA to find out how to communicate about, among different teams. PDSA number two was how to distribute the workload. Hospital development was our third project, which was how does a DCD case look? And then we went into the family services and that's when we started to address the first person authorization. What does the PDSA one meant about how to communicate? Javi, we know how to do that. We are today on Zoom. Don't tell me we don't know how to communicate. Well, I'll tell you that. We didn't know how to better communicate among the teams that were needed to get into the operating room for rapid or expedited DCD recoveries. We quickly identified that those were the cases where we were losing our potential for DCD donors, families that were ready to withdraw life support and they couldn't wait more than two, three, four, five hours before we could set up a operating room for the recovery. We needed to find out a better way to communication because as good as the smartphones are for having text messages, they are not as smart to keep all of these different groups into the know, into the need of what do we need to do to get this patient into the operating room and recover organs successfully. So we wanted to identify that communication tool and our PDSA number one was identifying or utilizing a Teams group chat as a trial where we were including our organ placement specialist, which is the team member that specializes on finding a home for all the organs through a location. Our administrator of on call for the organ team, which is the one that oversees all the activity from the organ side and the donor management referrals, authorization and all things of the sort. Our donation recovery specialist, a specialist administrator on call, which is the one that is in charge of the team members that are in the operating room, assisting in the recovery of organs, meaning perfusionists and packaging of the organs. Our authorization coach, which is the uh, person that takes care of the family care specialist so that they can have the good approach with the families and our donation system specialist supervisor. There was a survey following each group chat that was created. As soon as we identified that there was a new potential rapid DCD case, we would start this group chat and all communication was through this group chat. The beauty of it is that whenever I was done with my shift as an AOC, I could remove myself and add the incoming AOC into that group chat and the communication could stay live and up to the minute whenever there was new developments ongoing for this patient, uh, for this uh, donor care. We did 10 group chats where they were created. And in short, one of the questions on the surveys was how useful did you find the Teams group chat as a communication tool? Most of the people said that it was extremely useful. And with that, we decided to, to establish the Teams group chat as the way of communication when we were going to have a rapid DCD recovery. The next item that uh, was uh, surfaced from that is how are we going to distribute the workload? Because one thing was to say on the group chat, okay, so you do this, you do that, you're in charge of doing it. And then how do we track that you actually did it before we went and did cross clamp? We didn't have a heparin order. We cannot do withdrawal of life support. We didn't do our organ blood. You better don't do heparin and don't do a cross clamp. And we didn't have a pronouncing physician. You definitely do not do incision on that DCD donor. <laughs> So what did we do with that? We had the second PDSA, how to distribute that workload. We created this rapid recovery checklist for workload distribution. It was the same people that was on the Teams group chat as mentioned below. The list, that, uh, that Excel list that uh, is on the picture in, in, in the slides, it was dynamic, meaning that every time that someone was assigned to that, that, uh, that item would change to a yellow color. And if you see to the right of it, there is a red box. As soon as someone had completed it, they would put their name on it. And then 
all the label to the left, instead of pending, it would now be white and it would have like a, a green mark, meaning I don't have to worry about that anymore. The goal was to get into the OR as soon as all of the red boxes are marked off. This was assigned by groups and every, every, every team member had their specific task, their specific assignment. If I was coming out of the shift, the same thing would happen. It was assigned to me. Now I can assign it to, to Kate because she's coming in. So she can now take care of that task and she will be in charge of marking it as completed before they go to the operating room. Our plan was to get to 10 cases. We could only observe five cases. Uh, that was because the time frame for it was just strong. And also we were finishing up with cohort A. So we did five cases, but what we did find was that it was it, this tool provided a better workload distribution as well as an easier follow-up on pending tasks to achieve the procurement of the organ successfully and an effective tracking of responsibilities among the team members. Nothing was dropped and we were successfully into going into the operating room without any tasks that were pending in these five cases to the point that now we have a standard operative procedure that includes this checklist on our rapid recoveries for DCD or brain dead donors that are crashing and they need to go to the operating room as soon as we can. So that was PDSA number two. I mentioned the third project which was a hospital development and it was how does a DCD case look? And this was the most fun of, of the four projects because on this one, we got to shot a video. And I don't know if you can tell, but I am a very shy individual and I get very camera timid. I'm not looking at you on the eyes. I'm sure I'm not looking at the camera right now. But what we did on this is that we portray how the DCD uh, process looked. And we shot, shot this video at the Houston Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation and Education. And we went from authorization all the way to organ pro for OR procurement surgery. It included all of the aspects and all of the hurdles that are part of our standard process at LifeGift. And on this video, once it was shot, it was about six to 10 minutes video. We are now able to show that video to all of the external audiences, including our hospital partners uh, in a symposium, as well as all of our hospital partners whenever they have a question about, so how does the DCD look like? Here it is. Now you have a video. Now you can see how it's exactly that it's going to look like. At the time, I was not an abdominal organ recovery surgeon, so I think I played the role of an anesthesiologist, which will now be a conflict of interest if I was extubating the patient and then doing incision. So I do not do that. If you get to see that video, that is the only thing that is not accurate on the whole presentation that was shot for that, for that audience. But it was a tremendous success because now we cannot only tell the staff members what are they going to expect. We can show them ahead of time so that they can see how is it that the DCD looks like on our process at LifeGift. And all, not only that, they can hold us accountable. If there is a team member that is not doing what they are supposed to be doing, say a huddle, and they don't want to participate in the huddle well, but it, I saw on the video that they showed me the other day that there was going to be a huddle with all of the team members. I'm not, I don't see the donation clinical specialist here. So it is a tremendous success in our, uh, in our developing of uh, partnerships with our hospital partners. The next thing that we did was the family services on how to address a first person authorization. And this was just a project that we started in cohort A. What we did at that time was create a family services task force, create, uh, was, was integrated by family care coordinators, organ management coordinators, and organ recovery coordinators. The goal at the time when we started this project was to implement a DCD first person authorization process to honor the donor designation and family considerations specifically surrounding the time constraints and the patient suffering. We didn't want to spend any more time than what the family was asking us to spend on these donors. And more importantly, we didn't want to lose any opportunities because the family said, we don't want to move forward with this and we're gonna bring the lawyers and we're going to make this big news uh, forecast saying that you are forcing us to do this. So. The one thing that we did find is that if the family said we wanna withdraw in three hours, we should accommodate to get in the operating room in three hours and how are we going to be able to do that? And that's why we created this task force. And at that point, cohort A ended. So we didn't get to work on that on cohort A, but then we came back to cohort B and that's where we really established all of our first person authorization journey. I was mentioning in the, in the learning conference in Denver that given that we participated in cohort A as well as cohort B, when we did cohort A, as you saw, we did a lot of 
well, we did the two PDSAs. We did a lot of planning for this first person authorization implementation project. We did the video that took more than uh, it should have. It took like 10 minutes, but trust me, the shooting of the video, it was one time my hair was on one side, the other time the hair was on the other side. My tie was not correctly. Why are you wearing a tie in the operating room? So things of the sort, you know, when you are shooting a video. But anyhow, uh, what we did was a lot of work on the cohort A that could not be seen because it was a lot of behind the scenes work. When we came to cohort B, we were already presenting the things that we were doing and how were we implementing the first person authorization, all of these lists that we were creating and all of these different ways of communication that were established. And people that was coming in for the first time in cohort B had the hardest time in my opinion, because they were looking at some OPOs like us that were coming from cohort A with a lot of the legwork done and just presenting results on cohort B and people in cohort A were like, wait a second, uh, like, I'm sorry, in cohort B were like, wait a second, like how is it that these people at IFTF are so advanced? Well, we were not, we just had a head start over the cohort A, over the cohort B people. And I think that that was key. And, I, and, and that was something that uh, we tried or like people from the cohort A was trying to re-establish re and, re and mention one over and over again for the meetings on the cohort a and B when we went to cohort B is that don't don't worry, don't sweat it. You're doing a lot of work. It just doesn't look like you are doing it a lot of work, but trust me, you are doing a lot of work. Uh, so with that, we went to cohort B, right? So now we're the superstars because I have established that we had done all the legwork in cohort A. So in cohort B, we're shining like, like a diamond. So what we, we do with the first person authorization? We wanted to change the practice and the philosophy because for the longest time up to this point, LifeGift has always said it is a family's option to say yes or no to DCD when it comes to organ donation, even if they have a registry. So we need to change our practice, our philosophy. We need to make sure that the legal framework was in order to be compliant with what the legal, uh, the legalities of personal authorization are. We needed to put this and connect to purpose from the family perspective. Like I mentioned, what is it that the family want? How, why is it, what is it that they're saying no? And how can we turn their, uh, their negative to a, an alliance with us to make organ donation happen. How are we going to do an authorization to disclose, change from authorization to disclosure for the first person authorization, change the donation systems practice, our organ operations practice so that we can then make donation happen and then start training our teams, training our donor hospitals and address any challenges with the implementation of this new practice. We started in the fall of 2021 with this planning and we decided to divide and conquer, of course. So we had different subject matter experts, as you can see on this slide, where we were working on each of our individual areas to make this process as effective as we could. We did our charter, our roadmap on it. You can go on it and find every single detail that we did in the sense of who is addressing with the legal team, what kind of uh, challenges we have, we, we may find, we may face with the families, what kind of challenges we may face with the hospitals. It's not legal what you're doing, we'll say a CEO. No, it is legal. How can we address that with the hospital CEO? How can we address that with the family member that is has a legal a lawyer in the family? And through all of that, our final uh, final uh, piece of our piece of work that we found was this process where we have a very specific role on what is it that we are going to do if the family is opposed to organ donation, if the patient is a registered donor, if the hospital is opposing or organ donation, if the family is threatening to bring the news, if the family is threatening with uh, bringing guns to the hospital, which trust me has happened, uh, not the guns meaning to the hospital, but the threat of someone bringing guns to the hospital. How are we going to protect our staff? How are we going to protect the hospital staff? How are we going to ensure that everyone is safe? All of that we put it into this, this uh, wonderful diagram where we are now having this process map and we know exactly what to do. Everyone knows what to do. Everyone comes to this process map and we know exactly who is going to be doing what when it comes to family opposition for organ donation. The main goal, of course, was to uh, get to honor the first person authorization without exception. And I can tell you that to July, when we had these numbers done, we have had opposition, but we have not had walk away from any DCD potential donor that has first person authorization with family resistance not allowing time. We have got rapid recoveries. We have had some recoveries where, like I said, there's been threat of gun violence. Thankfully, none of that has happened. Thankfully, all of the donors have been making it to the OR. 
And now we're working on what will be next now that the cohort B has finished. And at this point, we're working on rapid DCD on call teams so that they can we can always be available for these rapid recoveries, a new escalation process for the review of suitability, what family is opposing, hospital position on first person authorization with resistance, so that we can have a timely notification or updated notifications with changes to the plan. Of course, continue to work with referral education with hospital partners and work on allocation practices. I know that this is a very hot topic, so I'm not even going to dig any deeper on that, other than we need to find a timely organ offering to the adequate transplant center that is willing to accept these organs, because sometimes we're going to have to allocate organs pre serologies or sometimes we're going to have to wait a few hours before the serology is back. And those, oh, those kidneys are going to be on a perfusion pump or on ice if they couldn't be perfused. And if the transplant center is aware of the challenges of what we took to get this donor to the operating room, it might, it might change which transplant center you need to get to to offer this organ so that we can get them transplanted and not just procured and discarded. And that is all of I, all that I have with my time slot. So I'm going to pass it along to Jacqueline. Thank you. There we go. Now I can share. Okay. Maybe. You guys able to see that? Okay. Well, thanks, Javi. First, um, so excited to be here and excited to be part of the collaborative and we were part of cohort B so we kind of felt the same way just like you were saying that we were a little bit behind the curve. But I think that we caught up and and we now know the things that we want to work on. So just some objectives for today we're going to go over how we implemented the collaborative as an organization and our use of root cause analysis and why that matters to us and when it's feasible to use it to implement change. We're gonna go over the creation of our rapid DCD task force. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about what's next for us. So we are right there at the southernmost point of San Diego. We currently have 28 hospitals that we cover and they are building a 29th right now. And we serve about 3.5 million people. And when the collaborative came around, we really decided to do a deep dive into our data, specifically our authorizations and declines in the prior year. We used root cause analysis to determine where our shortfalls were because we knew that we would find the answers in our data. And so our goal initially was not to only increase DCD authorization, but to increase our baseline DCD percentage, but without affecting our brain dead donation percentage. We initially involved anybody that we knew touched a DCD case. So of course our onsite coordinators, our family services, our surgical services, our hospital development, our AOCs and our physicians. And our first meetings were really just to update everyone about what the collaborative was and to hone in on those goals. At first, we didn't know what we were going to do or what we wanted to tackle. But as an organization, we really pride ourselves on utilization of lean principles. As you saw in my bio, I am a Lean Six Sigma black belt, and there are two others in-house as well as numerous green belts. So we knew we would need to start from the beginning and do a root cause analysis of our process as a whole to determine the right next steps and where to focus our efforts. We knew pretty early on that we wanted to focus on our objectives, specifically those DCD consent rates, as well as our overall percentage. But again, like I said, it was super important that we not lose brain dead donors in the process. So as a lean organization, we've really realized the efficacy of lean principles and knew this project was really a great candidate for it. So what is root cause analysis? Well, it's used when you want to get to the root of a problem, pretty simple. There's five steps. First, you need to identify what the problem actually is. And for us, that meant looking at our DCD data. We needed to know where we were starting. And then we had to collect a sufficient amount of that data. Thankfully for us, the data was there. We just had to compile it. And then we had to identify causative factors. There are several ways to go about this and we'll go over what we used. And then you look at all those causative factors and you begin to drill them down. So Lean offers a lot of tools for this. And again, I'll just go over one of the ones that we used. And then you start to implement solutions. Once you've determined the root cause or the cause you feel confident that you can tackle, it's time to brainstorm and find those solutions. So when we started to look back into our data for 2021 and the reasons family cited for declining donation, we knew we had a 50, 55% authorization in 2021 for those DCD donors. 
So we looked at those big reasons just straight from our charting why families were declining. And as you can see at the top there, withdrawing immediately was the biggest factor. So we also needed to make sure that we were looking at modifiable and non-modifiable reasons. Obviously, we can't do anything about the families that want to bury their loved ones whole, cultural beliefs, things like that we can't change, but we can change that they want to withdraw immediately, not necessarily that they want to withdraw immediately, but how we respond to that. So we found that we had 27 declines in 2021 for timing issues. And unfortunately, 12 of those patients were registered. So after that, we looked at the process problems and big bucket reasons why we weren't catching those DCD donors. Were they progressing to brain death? Were those referrals coming in late? Were they over age 65 and so we weren't chasing them anyway? Was there a lot of other donor activity going on? So with those reasons in mind, we dug into the data a little bit further and we used a fishbone diagram to begin to determine the reasons. We decided to focus the bulk of our efforts on areas we could co exert control over in the time frame we had in the collaborative. And this led us to realize that rapid DCDs were a huge weak spot for us and something we felt we could improve. We also knew that late referrals were part of that picture. And so that is something that we talked about as well. And you'll see that at the end. But then we drilled down further and realized we really did not have an effective rapid DCD plan that we had looked at recently and we knew we could probably make some changes. So this is a process map, it's pretty busy, but from there we determined what our current rapid DCD process looked like with this map. As a group, we looked at each step. So each step is a box and decided where that fell in the process and what, if anything, could be changed about that process or that step. So what you don't see on this is that we also did this for every area. So for surgical services, for our on-site coordinators, for hospital development, for family services, everybody got their own process map and they met as a group to try to see how we could streamline these processes a little bit more. And from there, we decided to create a rapid DCD task force. Now, I'm sure when I say task force, this is probably what you think about, but of course we're not in Afghanistan and we're probably not wearing camo. And yes, this is my yearbook photo from my deployment to Afghanistan. It's a real photo. But a task force is a temporary grouping under one leader, for the purpose of accomplishing a definite objective. So instead of looking like that, we united as a team under our fearless leader with the objective of overhauling our current rapid ECD process. We had meetings to determine what would be the best way to revamp and what our key focus was. Now, I know a lot of your OPOs probably already have a rapid protocol, but it's always worth looking at it again. Now that NRP and OCS are part of the picture, we knew that we had more technology that we needed to weave into our process. And our goal was to be able to offer a rapid option to families and complete a case in four hours while still incorporating those new technologies if we were able to. So this is the document that was created during the collaborative, we completely overhauled an, our existing rapid DCD document. And unlike Javi and his team who made this in a format on Teams, we actually decided to go a different direction and we made it into a paper format that our on-site staff could easily print and everyone could work from the same form. And there were a couple of reasons we did that. One of them being when we get to the hospital, we often have a limited computer access. And so we didn't want everybody kind of fighting to try to get on a different computer. We have service um, and connection issues in some of our hospitals as well. So that kind of knocked out maybe being able to use a Teams format. And then we wanted this document to be able to be printable. The on-site coordinator could print it and just kind of pass it around. So what we did with this document first, we defined what each category of a rapid DCD was, whether it was a rapid and expedited or an uncontrolled DCD. This wasn't necessarily important for our on-site coordinators, but it was important important in terms of resource allocation and how many on-site personnel the AOC needed to send to help. After that, we bolded the areas that had to be done prior to taking a donor to the OR. So in cases where there was uncontrolled chaos and the patient is crashing, our team knew exactly what had to be done before they could roll that donor to the OR. And then we broke it out the individual responsibilities. We knew that these areas could overlap, but it made it easier for those people arriving on site later to see what needed to be done. So you can see we broke it out to our AOC, our family services, as well as our primary OPC or other staff that's coming, coming to the bedside. And then we have our legend. And so that asterisk, it just you know says what that asterisk is. And those are areas in the OPC section that HD and family services can also assist with because it's not necessarily a clinical task. And then after using this a few times, we added an area to 
let everybody know what organs we were looking at. And this was important in terms of knowing what other steps may be needed. Were we going to be needing to call heart teams? Were we needing to loop in OCS? Were we looking at thoracics? Stuff like that. And then I have to say, these are probably the most helpful, one of the most helpful things that came out of this task force. So these are three really simple pieces of paper that have really made a world of difference. And these are just guidelines for our bedside nurse, our pronouncing provider, and our respiratory therapist. We all know when it comes to a DCD, we huddle, huddle, huddle so many times, make sure we're communicating and getting everything across to the hospital team that we can. But in cases of a rapid DCD, that's really difficult for people to do. And so we created these guidelines. It's every single thing that these people need to do in order to help us get to the OR and get this donor you know, to the recovery. And it just lays it out in a really simple format with, with timestamps and everything. And it's been so successful. The feedback has been so great that we're actually using it in our regular DCD process as well, because of course people, sometimes they're visual learners, sometimes they're auditory learners, and this is just a form they can refer back to over and over. And then we can do one big huddle right before extubation and everybody knows what's expected. The other form that came out of the collaborative was this early family interactions document. And in one of the early meetings of the collaborative, we saw another OPO utilizing a similar document and we loved the concept. So we changed it up a little bit, we slapped our logo on it and handed it out. And truly that's the beauty of the collaborative. This working together and sharing of best practices has been so helpful for us as an organization. And so I'm sure many of you have heard of these early family interactions and just recognizing those early family cues, but we're really starting to try to push that data out to our hospital partners as well. As far as outcomes, this is the yearly total July to July. And you can see that our total DCD donors increase as well as our organs transplanted for donors. Now, I will acknowledge that our zero organ donors increased as well, but we truly feel that that shows how aggressive we've been and chasing everything we can in order to try to save more lives. But look at those five, six, and even seven organ DCD donors. That's so impressive and shows the efficacy of the new technologies and our ability to go after more donors that truly we probably wouldn't have chased in the end. And by the end of the collaborative, we had increased our DCD rate to 32% and increased our authorization rate by 6%. And we know that there's a lot of work to do still. This means that we may need to go back and tackle another area, or we can even look at our process again. We realized by joining the collaborative that our beginning total DCD percentage of 26% was actually low compared to other OPOs, and we weren't aware of that. Through the process of learning what those other OPOs were doing, we were able to not only increase this percentage while also increasing our brain dead donors as well. And then of course, additionally, with the recent recommendations from the NASM report to increase DCD donors to 45% of all donors without decreasing brain dead donors, we just have more room to grow. So what are the next steps for us? Well, we've implemented the family services resource position and that's been really helpful just in helping everybody recognize those family cues and having another resource to call on top of our AOC. We have started family readiness assessments, all of our rounding people on site staff will complete these every time they round and just get the most updated information on the family. We've increased our authorizations training and given our coordinators more language to help support first person authorization. And then our HD team has continued to work with hospitals to help support first person authorization for those DCD donors as well. And that is all I have. Thank you everyone for just valuable resources. I know that when we went through this slide deck, I couldn't wait to get my hands on these and everyone pretty much had the same questions that I did. However, we've had a lot of questions come through the chat. So Javi, I'm gonna ask you if you wanna address some of those for those who haven't read the chat. I think that those are very beneficial. I know I had the same questions when I heard you talk about the video. <laughs> Yes, so um, the video, I guess there was a question about it being available for sharing. And yes, we do have it available for sharing. I have shared my email address on the uh, chat so that if you want to get your hands on that video, please feel free to email me. I have gotten already a few requests over the email. So we will definitely be sending those uh, links so that you can have it available if you want to see a little bit more on me on video I'm, I'm i'm so humble i'm so sorry guys but yeah so that you can see some of the the video and all of the resources that we use in there so that you can either use it or copy it and make your own for sure that's wonderful that's so generous i'm sure everyone's going to email you for that 
Um, Javi, also going back to your communication, I know that that was internal communication that you discussed, but we had some questions regarding whether an interpreter was ever used for families when you were part of that communication. I know you addressed some of that in the chat, but I think that that's an ongoing concern every day. Are we meeting families' needs and expectations when we're you know, addressing that? Are we using the correct interpreters? We do have, well, we're in Texas, first of all. We service Houston, Fort Worth, and the Lobok area. Given that we live in Texas, I think that our largest minority is a Spanish speaking min uh, minority, right? It's our majority of the minority is usually uh, from somewhere in, south of the border or uh, and they speak Spanish. And given that our largest minority is Spanish, we have an interpreter in house that is uh, part of our family care specialist team who is a Spanish speaking interpreter. That tackles most of the challenges that we face on these rapid cases. And for those, given that we, we live in Houston and we have like what the fourth largest city with the most minorities in, in the States or something along those lines, we have many other languages that are also presented in the hospitals whenever we're facing these approaches to the family. So we do contract with an, uh, an interpreted agency ha that has served the best for our needs. In, in terms of translating to the T what we are saying, because you know the problem with interpreters, we say something and then they translate something completely different or something, a couple of words that just change the meaning of what we're trying to say. Um, thank you. Um, based on that, we did get a question prior to the um, webinar coming on and they wanted to know that if any one of you could share strategies to improve you know, communication and messaging to the minority and Hispanic groups regarding DCD donations, when you're setting with them or even when you're providing education to the hospital, you know, what are your messaging that you're going to share with them? I was hoping someone else would unmute, was unmuting, but okay, so I'll go with it. <laughs> so yes, it is It is one of the challenges, definitely. Like one, one of the things that we do bring to them is uh, most of the numbers that we have on the waiting list, the statistics of what we see. Uh, it is always heard or it is not heard, but it is the myth that, well, only white people gets the organs. Why should I give my organs as, as, a, as a Hispanic, uh, as a Mexican, as a South American, as a Venezuelan, whatever it is, your nationality, right? And it is not the truth, right? Uh, we all know it on this panel and we all have the resources to show this to the hospital partners and, and to show this to the family members whenever they are facing their uh, decision, having to make the decision to move forward with organ donation. When it is first person authorization, it's always an easier conversation to an extent. But when it is a non-registered donor that we need to obtain full authorization from the family, it's a little bit more complicated when it comes to showing them. And that is not even counting on the religion aspect of it. If you have a person from, uh, from uh, the Hispanic community and they are a firmly believer of the Catholic, uh, Catholic church, then it's always easier when you have a Pope that is saying that it's good to have organ donation. You can show that, that those quotes from the Pope and they, they open up a little bit. But uh, with uh, so many other Christian uh, Christian um, faith uh, uh, faith religions, it's it's going to be a little bit harder because if you don't have a leader on this particular church that is saying that, you cannot just extrapolate like what the Pope says or, or what the leader says from this church or that church when that doesn't apply to my church because I come from this different church. So it it is a little tricky uh, when it comes to the religion portion of of things, but. Thankfully, to this date, and anyone in the in the chat can not let me lie on this, but a most or, or not to say all of the religions are always saying something positive about organ donation. So uh, there's not not one that says uh, say no to organ donation, to my knowledge. Thank you. Um, we did have a few questions prior to the webinar starting and the discussion starting whether uh, family readiness assessments were being utilized in the cohort. I think everyone jumped on those. They were so effective. Uh, we adopted them at the OPO I'm at. And Jackie really showed what hers looks like. Um, one of the questions that came through the chat, will this be part of the group, the documents that you share with everyone? If no one's seen those yet, they are wonderful when you first put your eyes on them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, we will be sharing those. Again, we, we got them from another OPO, so I think that's just the beauty of the collaboratives, that sharing. Yeah, we'll make those available. Thank you, you're so generous with those. Um, another question that came through was, are any of your OPOs using the DCD evaluation tool prior to going in to the OR project withdrawal? So I can speak a little bit to that. As an organization, we have statistically really shied away from 
predictor tools. We really pride ourselves on being aggressive and going after everything because we truly believe that that's what's best for our donors. That's what's best for recipients. That being said, we're trialing some tools. We're just in the data collection phase. We're using it more from an allocation perspective, just to help give transplant centers more information to help them make decisions about whether they want to come on site. We're not using it to rule out or rule in donors in any way. Thank you. Um, I think this is a question that floats around all the time is how does your OPO handle a late referral where the family's wanting to limit treatment immediately? Um, so you can preserve that opportunity for a family to be offered the opportunity for donation to happen. And what about first person authorization honoring that? How do you slow that process down? Those are the hardest ones when they, they, you get the phone call and the family is ready to withdraw life support and I cannot do anything. And the hospital partner is saying, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to let them withdraw. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that we, we want to, like we do constant rounds on the high level or on the higher level hospitals, hospital A's and hospital B's in our region uh, here in Life Gift. And we try to always uh, get those referrals on our board so that we can like keep on following actively on those cases. And we can some be a little bit of prepared. If you have a registered donor that is on the ventilator that the family is starting to have conversations or there are plans to have conversations with the care, uh, primary care team or with palliative care, those are the ones that jump to a priority list so that we can start following up those uh, closer than others. But in the end, you still have the phone call from those families, from those nurses saying like, hey, uh, the family just came and they wanna withdraw life support. Uh, I can say that when it is a case like that, chances are that the family really just changed their heart and they wanted to come and withdraw life support in the next hour or now. And we do our best trying to uh, get to that family. And even if we haven't done organ suitability, what we have done is that if a family comes back and says that they want to withdraw life support now, we bypass any doing a referral suitability and we go directly to talk to those families. And if later on, as we are doing our suitability and maybe they are signing up the consent for organ donation or the disclosure for DCD for a first person authorization, we find out that that patient is not an organ donor. Then we go to the families and say like, hey, during the further evaluation, we unfortunately found out that your patient had no suitability for organ donation. At the beginning, we do a rapid screening on them because if we have a patient that is coming with end-stage renal disease, liver cirrhosis, and pulmonary hypertension, and the nurse is giving you that past medical history, well, there's no point of talking to the family for, for that uh, patient that is on top of that 68 years old. Uh, if it is a donor that has none of the big red flags, then we send our family care specialist to talk to that family immediately so that we can, we can obtain authorization and worry about the suitability afterwards. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, we're very, very fortunate here in San Diego that we can drive from one end of our DSA to the other in about 45 minutes. So I'll, I'll say that up from the get-go. I know that not everybody can do that, but we've really been beefing up our rounding protocols. Um, we're on site once a day for every donor that we have on the board, and then we call or go on site a second time. And then not only are we rounding in those units where we actually have patients that we're following, our coordinators are rounding through all the other units as well as rounding through the OR or sorry, not the OR, the ED. And our hospital development staff has been meeting our coordinators on site to kind of help look at best rounding practices. And then of course, the family readiness assessment and having that family services resource to just really pick up those early family cues. Like, oh, everybody's coming into town. Maybe we should be paying closer attention to that. Um, thank you. I, I know that, um, Javi, you did talk about, you know, your rapid DCDs, you have a checklist for it, you have an algorithm, but what's the most common resistance that you encounter at the OPO for, you know, rapid DCDs? I know in our OPO, we have challenges with securing an OR during the day and then not having an OR staff during the night to come in. Did you have to navigate those? I'm sure that you did. And how did you successfully, you know, book an OR? <laughs> I'm going to say success is in the eye of the beholder, right? But <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right, Amanda. There's That's the number one problem that we have, securing mm -hmm. an operating room. Uh, even though we have a partnership with one of our local hospitals in Houston, where we have our donor recovery suite at the hospital, a DCD donor cannot be transported to that operating room. And even if we, uh, like, 
it's impossible to transfer someone uh, to go over a five minute period waiting period from hospital A to hospital B where we have our maternal recovery suite. And uh, the one uh, thing that we try to do is we have a scrub tech that we provide in the end, if the, the extubation happens in the ICU or in the PACU, just give me an operating room, uh, provide me the uh, scrub nurse, I'm sorry, not the scrub nurse, but the circulator just, or give me access to all of the, the supplies that you have in the hospital and I'll provide my scrub tech and my life gift recovery surgeons and my perfusionist. I just need an operating room that is sterile and we'll do all the work. So that has helped tremendously to uh, bring an operating room to fruition in the hospital partners that we have here in Houston. Without the scrub tech, it's a little bit more challenging because then it's like, oh, I need to provide you with a circulator. Oh, I need to provide you with, with, a, uh, with a scrubbing nurse. Oh, I need to provide you with this and that. And uh, I mean, like I said, on a city donor, if we're not going to do the extubation in the operating room, which chances are that we are not going to do that if the patient, if the hospital is providing us with an operating room, we're just going to proceed with having our uh, scrub tech in there and uh, have them just provide us with the instruments. And to a point that alleviates a little bit, because even though they, they, they have the operating room, they just don't have the personnel to have the operating room available. We are hospitals where they have like 60 operating rooms, but they don't run 60 operating rooms at the same time. Thank you. We have a we have a lot of questions that we could continue to go through. I know that we haven't touched base with Kate. Um, the collaborative improvement has been so beneficial. Uh, just hearing from two OPOs and what they've um, you know developed and put into practice and shown that the increase in transplant organs out of DCDs and DCDs can can really work when we work together. Um, I'll leave it on the last question that uh, we had come through the chat. Um, what is the biggest reason why there's so many more DCD donor cases in Europe and other places? Is it the shortest of short, shortage of properly trained staff? Is it the cost? Okay. Sorry, Happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to say that probably the opt-in or opt-out, right? Is it in Europe, like you are a donor until you say no? That definitely has to do something with it. The second one is that what I have seen in the uh, different conferences, the practice in Europe is that you have your own, uh, the, the transplant centers do not travel to recover the organs, which means that now you have the local transplant centers recovering the organs. I do not know if that should be the way of, uh, organ donation in the United States, either the opt-in, the opt-out system, because we're an opt-in system, or either having our transplant centers, the local transplant centers recovering the organs, or uh, the, the transplant centers in other regions. What I can tell you is that since we have implemented the first person authorization, we have had an increase uh, in the number of DCD donors that we are approaching, and not, not necessarily an increase in the number of DCD donors, although we have observed that, we have also observed an increase in the numbers of donors that are authorized non recover from DCDs, because we're pursuing every DCD donor that is a first person authorization, and some of them don't die. The statistics doesn't change. If you have, if you, if we had a thirty percent success rate in the in the number of DCD donors that were dying before, uh, now we still have that thirty percent. The thing is that now we're approaching so many more uh, donors that we have a bigger number of DCD donors. So it will have an impact in the number of attempts that you will have for sure. The other thing is that we have our local recovery surgeons, and since we started having our local recovery surgeons at Life Gift in this year, beginning of January. We have been able to successfully go to the operating room and try to give, I'll give the opportunity to those donors, to those patients to become donors if they do expire within 90 to 120 minutes, even if it is sort of for the recovery of kidney exclusive. And that has significantly increased also or impacted our numbers in the uh, opportunities that we have provided for these DCD potential donors, because we do have a, a recovery surgeon that is ready and available to go whenever we have this patient. Before 2022, we had to beg transplant uh, surgeons to come and recover for us on this rapid recovery. And we would go through a list of 20, 25, 30 potential transplant surgeons to come and do us a favor to recover on these kidneys that they didn't know if it was going to go to their transplant center or not. And that will impact the number of times that we had to say, sorry, family, we cannot go in two hours because the 
the closest time that we can get a, a transplant surgeon to recover is five hours from now, and you want to go to the operating room in two hours from now. So uh, again, if you can afford a local recovery surgeon on your OPO, that definitely is going to have an, a positive impact on your ability to have these rapid cases go to the operating room. Thank you. And thank you all for your time and your dedication to the OPTN DCD procurement collaborative improvement process um, and the implemented practices that you share. Before we sign off, do any of the panelists have any additional thoughts or comments or best practices to share? I think for us, it's just been about embracing change change is inevitable it's it's coming a lot of new things are coming and you know trying to just learn as much as you can about the changes and communicate with your team communicate 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 learn 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 and don't be afraid to implement things try them out see if they work for your opo I absolutely agree with Jacqueline. And the one thing that we didn't mention in here throughout our presentations was NRP, as, as it is being mentioned. It's going to change how we do the city donors. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get into the different uh, conversations that are surrounding NRP, but I can tell you that once it's all settled and everyone has agreed in what is the best way to implement it, everything will change drastically on how we interact with our DCD donors. So if you do not know what NRP is, this is the moment to start digging and sharing and, and looking for your OPO partners so that, so that we can as, an OP, as OPOs have at least an understanding of what we're expecting from NRP and what are our, our, our needs so that when the transplant center comes to your OPO, you know exactly what are you getting into. And I'll just say that I think for me, I think one of the take home messages is don't be paralyzed by perfection. I know I've, for us, we wanna improve our, our offerings and our deployments each time we deploy a project and we're constantly taking that feedback and improving. And I just heard Jackie and Javi both talk about how they've really run those PDSA cycles and they figured out things that worked or didn't work and they just keep moving forward. You tweak it and keep moving forward. So just try not to be paralyzed by perfection and just keep, keep going. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Probably be helpful if I unmuted myself, but <laughs> I just wanted to say on behalf of the Alliance team, thank you all for joining us today. And certainly thank you for your willingness to share all the tools, all your efforts. Um, in support of that, of course, the Alliance will be sharing the um, PowerPoint presentations that were presented today so that you all have access to that. And the recording itself will be available to all of you in attendance as well shortly um, after this program concludes. So again, I just want to say thank you. Um, and again, I, I support the message. Let's all embrace change and do what we can to, to push DCD efforts forward. So thank you all and take care. Thank you.